Your eyes see in 2D. The retina is a two-dimensional surface of cells that activate when photons hit them. Whether those photons are bouncing off of a physical object or being produced by your display, there isn't too much of a difference to the neural circuitry that makes up your vision system. So the brain is already doing the hard part. It takes a two-dimensional image as input, and on the other end you somehow have a near-instant understanding of the three-dimensional objects you are seeing. We can create objects by constructing them out of many triangles. To create an accurate 2D representation, we need to project each of these triangles onto a flat plane from the perspective of a viewer. It can be helpful to think of a computer screen as a window, where light bounces off of an object, through the window, and into your eye. So to generate an image, it's almost as if we need to do the reverse operation. If you shot a ray from your eye through each section of the window, what color would you hit? And this is the basic idea behind 3D graphics. Each pixel of the display is like a little window, and the more pixels, the clearer the image. And it is up to our graphics engine to figure out what color of light would be passing through that pixel as if the game world actually existed on the other side. The method I've explained, where rays are projected into the world and collide with objects, is the foundation behind ray tracing. Ray tracing has only recently made its debut into video games, with the release of newer graphics cards containing dedicated ray tracing hardware. On the other hand, CPU-based ray tracing has been around for a long time and has been used extensively within the movie and animation industries, but it is much too slow to be used in real-time applications. A single frame in Toy Story 4 could take anywhere between 60 to 160 hours to render using CPU-based ray tracing. Ray tracing is known as image order rendering, since each pixel is first considered, and then on a per pixel basis we find all the objects that could influence it. The alternative is object order rendering, which is much faster and what we have been using. This is where we draw each object one after the other. This approach maps much better to the GPU, since we can apply the same instructions but on different vertices in parallel. So we could find the location for each projected position within a vertex shader by calculating the line and plane intersection, and this would work just fine. But a much more effective way to do this is with a matrix transformation. First though, I want to start by explaining orthographic projection. In the previous tutorial, I talked about Vulcan's canonical viewing volume. Only the objects that are within this 2 by 2 by 1 region will be displayed. Note that the positive y-axis points down and positive z-axis points into the screen. An orthographic projection is a generalization of the view volume that allows us to specify whatever dimensions and whatever location we want but maintains the overall shape of the view volume and keeps the view direction and orientation fixed. The orthographic view volume is defined by six bounding planes. The left and right along the x-axis, the top and bottom along the y-axis, and the near and far planes along the z-axis. So these six values, left, bottom, near, and right, top, far, define the orthographic viewing volume. So to construct an orthographic projection matrix, we need to solve the following problem. How do you transform the orthographic view volume to Vulcan's canonical view volume? And the good news is, we already know how to do this. We can combine two basic transformations. First, translate the box so that the center of the near plane is at the origin. Then, follow that with a scale transformation so the boxes have the same dimensions. So the numerator will be the canonical view volume's dimensions, and the denominator will be the dimensions of the orthographic view volume. If we multiply the matrices and simplify, we get the orthographic projection matrix. Note that this matrix differs slightly from most other online resources. The canonical OpenGL view volume is a cube with a Z range of negative 1 to 1. Additionally, OpenGL uses a left-handed coordinate system and looks down the negative Z axis, but we're using a right-handed coordinate system and looking down the positive Z axis. So just keep this in mind if you are following other resources with different conventions. 
And that's it. By applying this transformation to our objects, the objects that are within the region occupied by the orthographic view volume will be scaled and moved into the region covered by the canonical view volume, and therefore the objects will be displayed. But the orthographic view volume doesn't apply perspective. To do that, we require a viewing volume that is not box-shaped, but a shape known as a square frustum. A frustum is the shape that captures a viewer's line of sight as if they were looking through a rectangular window. So what we want is a perspective matrix that transforms the frustum and any object it contains into the orthographic view volume. Doing so would apply perspective to all objects within this space. The farther away an object is, the smaller it will appear. To properly apply perspective, we need to project each point onto the viewing plane. For example, to calculate the apparent height of an object on the screen, we can use the property that the side lengths of two similar triangles are proportional to each other. We can rearrange this equation to show that an object's apparent height on screen is equal to the distance to the screen over the distance to the object, multiplied by the object's true height. This equally applies for the x direction when calculating an object's apparent width on the screen. Also note that just as with the other viewing volumes, anything outside of the frustum will be clipped. Okay, so what we would like to do is come up with some 4x4 matrix that when applied to a position vector, the resulting x and y values equal the projected xs and ys coordinates on the viewing plane. But there is a problem. We have a division by the z component in the solution's x and y components and a 4x4 matrix that can move a z-value from here to a division here simply does not exist. It is just not possible with matrix multiplication alone. But what's that? It's homogeneous coordinates to the rescue! We have one more trick up our sleeve. So far, the fourth component of all position vectors has been fixed, with w always equal to 1. This allows for matrix multiplication to implement translations. We will now additionally define w to be the denominator of the x, y, and z components. This means that the homogeneous vector x, y, z, w corresponds to the point at x over w, y over w, and z over w. This also means that vector 1, 2, 3, 1 is equal to the vector 10, 20, 30, 10, which is also equal to the vector 2, 4, 6, 2. These all represent the exact same position at 1, 2, 3. This division by w is automatically applied on the gl position variable output from the vertex shader and has always been occurring. If I go into our vertex shader and update the homogeneous coordinate value to 2 and run my code, my object becomes half the size because we now divide each position component by 2. Therefore, if the solution's w component is equal to z, it will be possible to calculate the projected coordinates of x and y onto the viewing plane. With this knowledge, we can start to construct the perspective matrix transformation. The first two rows have the distance to the viewing plane on the main diagonal and zeros elsewhere. This will have the effect of scaling the x and y components by the distance to the near plane. Next, the final row must be 0, 0, 1, 0 to take the z component from the input vector and move it to the w component of the solution vector. Now all that's remaining is the third row, and an easy mistake to make is to think this can also just be 0, 0, 1, 0 to copy the z depth values into the solution. The problem is, every component will be divided by w, including this one. z over z is just 1, and now we've lost our depth information and won't know which objects should be drawn in front of the others. So rewind. And in reality, we need the solution z component to equal z squared, since z squared over z is equal to z. But in our matrix, we only have two remaining unknown values to use. If we multiply this out, we get the equation m1 times z plus m2 equals z squared. This is a quadratic equation, meaning it has at most two real solutions and can't be true for other z values. Therefore, we will add two constraints that this equation is only true when z equals n or z equals f. This means that the transformation will not change the z values for points on the near and far planes, 
but all other z values will be warped non-linearly. This results in two equations that we can use to solve for m1 and m2. m1 times n plus m2 equals n squared, and m1 times f plus m2 equals f squared. Solving these equations, we get m1 is equal to f plus n, and m2 is equal to negative f times n. Let's plug this in, and the solution z component becomes f plus n times z minus fn. So let's take a minute to go over what this really means. We wanted to have a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the input z value and the output z value. But the best we could do is make this true for points at the near depth and far depth planes. The z depth values on the near and far planes remain unchanged, but the relationship is no longer linear. However, this is still useful because the relative ordering of the z values between the near and far planes is preserved. This means we can still use z to determine the ordering of objects within our scene. An advantage to having the z depth values be nonlinear is that calculations at the near plane will be higher precision than calculations at the far plane, reducing observable z fighting. Z fighting, also known as stitching or depth fighting, occurs when two surfaces are very close together. This visual artifact is caused by the rounding errors of floating point calculations and can be avoided by reducing the distance between the near and far planes. Now back to the perspective matrix. If you apply the perspective transform, followed by the orthographic projection transform, the combined result is known as the perspective projection transformation. And this is what we've been after. This matrix will transform objects contained by the viewing frustum into the canonical view volume, and in doing so will make the objects appear in perspective. We define the perspective projection matrix with the same values as used by the orthographic view volume, the six values R, L, B, T, N, and F. But it's often more convenient to use a simpler system where we assume the frustum is aligned along the z-axis, meaning that we are looking through the center of the window. This implies that left is equal to negative right and top is equal to negative bottom which then can be used to further simplify the matrix. Finally, it is common to specify a vertical field of view rather than use the values for the bottom and the right planes. The vertical field of view is the angle from the bottom to the top of the near plane relative to the viewer's line of sight. If we also know the aspect ratio of the window, we can easily calculate values for the bottom right corner with some basic trigonometry. So the bottom value is equal to the near plane distance times tan theta over two. And the right value is equal to the window's aspect ratio times the bottom. Plug this in and simplify, and we get the final form of the perspective projection matrix. If you enjoy computer graphics content like this, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and keep on coding. Cheers.